I'd just like to uh, have a brief summary of the chapters one and two that we've done already. You remember in chapter one, the disciples then, the new Christians, new born Christians, devoted themselves to personal relationship with one another, a personal devotion to God. They were listening carefully to the apostolic instruction, which sounds a bit posh, but it was instruction from the apostles. It was very, very special, very necessary at that time. The Bible wasn't available, not the New Testament anyway, only the Old Testament. And the New Testament was about to be uh, written by various people over the next few decades. There was that united association that they experienced, fellowship every day. Sometimes uh, we just find once a week meeting Christians is enough, uh, but it should be that we could meet at a different level. And I think sometimes in, in very good churches, you'll find that there is, there's a house group, there's a little prayer group here, there's people that go for coffee there, there's someone who does the shopping from somebody else here. And there is a far more of an interaction between the believers than just on a Sunday. There was the combined celebration. We might call it today Holy Communion, if you want to be posh. Or as the Bible puts it, the breaking of bread. Now that could mean breaking of bread as in, as in a meal and breaking... In, but as we, we had this morning here in this church, we, we had some bread and some wine to remind us of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And they were into prayer as well, divine intercession. Prayer meetings are not very popular these days. If we had announced tonight there will be a prayer meeting, say, um, Wednesday night, uh, and that was the only thing on the agenda, then who knows how many people would come? I don't know. I'm increasingly finding, the older and uglier I get, that prayer is the basis of it all. I wish I'd have learned that lesson far earlier. I wish I'd have prayed more. In fact, Billy Graham said that. He said... If I had my time over again, I would preach less and pray more. Now, many of us perhaps pray during the day. I hope you do. But it's very important for us, as it was for the early church. And remember, this early church was a saved church. Now, if you check around the churches in this area, throughout the country... How many of those churches are the membership of that church? How many of the members of that church are truly born-again believers? Now, there's no way of knowing that. But if you're like me, you know that my heart is so fickle that probably other people are the same. And you find that you get involved sometimes in churches and you find there's things going on there that shouldn't be. You find people don't believe quite what the Bible says, but they do attend the church or they come because it's the done thing. We need to have a church full of members and at the time of Peter and John in this instance, the church was full of people who were slaved people who had repented of their sins, people who had believed in Jesus Christ as their saviour. They were new Christians. They were only just baptised. The 3,000 were baptised on the day of Pentecost and after this sermon there was others no doubt baptised as well. Uh, we don't hear about that because it's now uh, part of the, of the church. Repent and be baptised. Repent and be baptised trusting in Jesus Christ. They were also a studying church. I hope that you're reading Christian books 
I know the Good News Centre is no longer with us, and uh, even the second-hand book department of the Good News Centre is no longer around. But if you want something to read, I've got plenty upstairs uh, for you to read. We should be reading not only the Bible, but good Christian books as well. We need to be a supportive church. Well, in a way, I suppose, in a small way, we've supported this church in the Philippines. And I hope that's encouraged you tonight to see just what a little bit of money from us can do. And it needs to be a sharing church. Not only sharing physical things like having food banks, which many churches do, uh, which is a great thing, but sharing the gospel with one another and with our neighbours, sharing at every level. I think sometimes we, <laughs> the early church would have shared more than we do. We all have our own lawnmower, don't we? We all have this, we all have that. But we could share an awful lot more, but we tend not to. And we need to have a church that's a spiritual church, not just a physical presence where you go through the, the rigmarole of, of, a, of a service, but something that's really deeply spiritual, especially when you come to the breaking of bread. It's a deeply spiritual event. In fact, it's possibly why in many churches, in my experience now, I've been travelling around uh, different churches over 50 years, in fact, more than 50 years, uh, as a full-time evangelist. I go to churches and initially they would have had a breaking of bread in the morning. In fact, very often I would go to that breaking of bread service before I preached the, the, the very next service, which might have been a family service or something like that afterwards. Now we're getting the breaking of bread absorbed into the family service and usually it's in the middle and it's five or ten minutes and that's about it and it sort of diminished in my opinion other churches they used to have a breaking of bread but now they don't they have one service on the sunday morning and nothing for the rest of the day and you think and just an occasional breaking of bread well that's the way things are going but not this early church. They broke bread literally having meals together and also broke bread to remember the Lord on a very, very regular basis. And it was a spreading church. I picked uh, Glebe Chapel simply because it, it is the, the biggest thing around here, at least the building is. Uh, and it's a spreading church. It's reaching out to the community. These amazing events of the day of Pentecost and the addition of, of initially 3,000 new believers was a really staggering event. But it hadn't upset Peter and John, hadn't sort of made them go off into euphoria and forget their, their discipline as believers in God. They continued to pray as faithful Jews did at nine o'clock in the morning at noon and at 3 p.m. We know that other religions pray five times a day. If you go to the Middle East, uh, uh, you'll get woken up by the early morning prayers. I think sometimes four o'clock in the morning or something, last time I was in Jerusalem. And, and you can hear them calling the people to prayer five times a day. Daniel, you remember, was threatened to be thrown into the, uh, to the lions, and yet he continued his daily practice of opening his windows towards Jerusalem and praying three times a day. David, the psalmist, tells us that he prayed evening, morning and noon. He said, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. If you look at the world, you're probably crying out to God in distress, aren't you? Certainly in certain aspects. Maybe in your own family, you cry out to God in distress. He wants to hear. He wants to help. And the way that we open that possibility in our lives 
is by praying on a regular basis. Paul wrote, you remember, that we were praying or should pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean to say you never say another word uh, other than prayer. It just means a constant reminder of prayer all the time. Every, there's so many things we could pray for. There are so many times when we could devote that particular time to God in prayer. I've taken to walking a little bit now to try and get back to sort of fitness. And it's amazing how many people actually walk their quiet time with the Lord. And while they're walking, they're, not, they're admiring nature, yes, but they're praying at the same time. You can pray when you're driving. In fact, sometimes when I was driving in London, you need to pray all the time. Uh, but, you know, just for your safety. But you can be praying all the time. That attitude of prayer is very important. Man, you remember, was lame from birth. I had problems with my legs when I was a youngster, and I had calipers on, and I had to go to bed with these jolly things on, uh, and it wasn't very pleasant. But the calipers did their job, and whatever else they did to me, uh, I, I can at least hobble around reasonably well these days. This man was born without the ability to walk. He was carried every day to his pitch. You talk to Mike Curtis about the street people and they all have their pitch. <laughs> uh, you know where they are because they've, they've worked a nice doorway somewhere where they can stick and they can hold out their palms <laughs> and ask for arms as we were thinking of earlier. Uh, they had their own pitch. This man had to be brought there by his friends, presumably, or his relatives. And he was carried to one particular place, just outside the temple courts. He couldn't go in. He was lame. He said, well, what, because he couldn't get up and said, no, he wasn't allowed. There was something wrong with him. He was de defective in his body. If there was something crushed and on your body, then Leviticus 21 gives you all, all the, the list of various things that prevented people actually going into the temple. He could only sit outside on the steps and ask for money. He couldn't go in. The temple police would have stopped him. It was against the law. That's just how fierce the law is in uh, its application. Notice uh, when Peter and John got there, they were full of confidence. <laughs> I don't know whether you've done any door knocking recently, evangelistically. Are you confident or are you like me, feeling, oh, I don't want to do this. Uh, these people don't want me here and, and they're going to think I'm a Jehovah's Witness uh, and, and they're going to abuse me, they're, they're going to punch me. I remember one man nearly did punch me simply because I was young and enthusiastic and didn't recognise that he was telling me he wasn't interested. And in the end, he uh, almost showed me that he wasn't interested. And then I got the message. <coughs> You've got to go with confidence, not confidence in your own strength, but confidence in the Lord. Peter and John knew what God would do in this situation. And notice the connection that they made. They looked at the guy. How many people do we see in Gloucester, say, and pass by on the other side? We don't really want to know. They were caring about this particular person. They made a connection with him. In fact, they even said, look straight at us. Look at us. And they looked straight at him. Eye contact is very important. If you've ever done any preaching, you know that when people lose eye contact with you, you've lost them. <laughs> You're in trouble. Or they're not interested, one or the other. Or probably a bit of both, maybe. There was absolute connection between these two disciples and this poor man that resulted in a wonderful miracle. 
and they, their candor was very clear too. They were absolutely certain, we haven't got any money. You want money, we, we haven't got a bean. We can't possibly help you in that direction. But he said there's something better. As we know from the story, they were able to give that to him. The early church and the church today has spiritual gifts. God has given to his church spiritual gifts, enough and more than we need to perform any service that he wants us to do. This week I made up a list of, well, they're, they're, my, they're my list of, of spiritual gifts. You may uh, want to delete a few, you may want to add a few, I don't know, but there's <clears throat> marriage, now that can be a gift, and yet Paul was very careful to say that if you don't get married, you save yourself a lot of trouble. And even though he wasn't a married man, he seemed to know. So there, there's blessings and, and problems as well that you might get in marriage. But celibacy is also a gift. I know some wonderful ladies, some that I've met on, on the mission field, who've devoted their whole lives to serving God. And they've just not got married, but totally given themselves over to God. It's not the gift that perhaps many of us want, but it's a spiritual gift. Serving, teaching, hospitality. You say, but that's, that's not... Yes, it is. It's a spiritual gift. It's not all miracles. It's not all babblings in different tongues and all that stuff. It's far more practical than that. And what about martyrdom? <laughs> you can only use that once, and that's not, not a terribly popular one. But there are men and women and boys and girls today who are giving their lives for Jesus Christ. Perhaps they weren't aware when they started this day that they were going to be in the presence of God. Maybe some of them in prison realised that their lives were being taken away from them or they were starving to death in North Korea, for instance, one of the worst places to be a Christian. <coughs> so we've got plenty of gifts. You can certainly encourage one another, can't you? And that's one of the gifts here. Showing mercy. Many, many other things. And these young believers, Peter and John, were showing mercy to this man. And more than that, they were able to share with this man something even greater than that, a miracle that they, he desperately needed. <clears throat> you notice in the Bible, in a list of the spiritual gifts, it speaks about the gifts of healing, not the gift of healing. Now, in evangelism, there are Certain uh, evangelists, I meet them sometimes uh, at big conferences, and they are known as healing evangelists. That's, that's their thing. They would preach somewhere. In fact, I remember the last time I <coughs> came across a certain brother was preaching at Crystal Palace, and he call, was calling people forward to receive Jesus Christ, to repent and believe. He'd preach the gospel, uh, to them, and he was also telling people that he could be, they could be healed that night. And <laughs> it staggered me that he had a queue of people who wanted to trust Christ coming here, down here, and a queue of people who were coming for healing. And it was staggering when we found out afterwards uh, from local pastors that yes, there were some people that trusted Christ, from this queue, and there are people that claim to have had a healing. In fact, the lady in, in the office I was working in at the time, she was a pastor's wife, and apparently this woman that came to their church uh, from time to time had something very, very seriously wrong with her legs, for her knees, I think, and she'd gone forward and, oh, yes, I've been healed. And 
so my friend said, well, will you come to church next week? Oh, no, no I don't want church. I, I came forward for the healing. And that was what Jesus found, wasn't it? It's what many people find. They want what they can get, but they don't want to submit completely and obey the gospel by sharing the good news. And, of course, a lot of people, like these evangelists, use... God as a sort of uh, automated vending machine. You remember those things that, <laughs> that you usually have to kick, don't you? <laughs> Anything drops down. And they feel that, oh, oh, oh yes, you can be healed. Be healed! And, and, and oh, she's been healed. And, you know, <sighs> I was in a service down in Newant maybe 20 years ago. My Father and mother-in-law walked out in disgust with what was going on. I stayed, not because I was a good fellow, I was staying to pray that the people that remained wouldn't be damaged any more than they already had been. There was a dear old lady who obviously had a diseased hip of some description and she was paraded around St Mary's uh, and she was hobbling like this. And then he prayed over her, oh, be healed. And then, go around the church again. You're healed. And she went around the church, she was hobbling, exactly the same as she went. That's not what God wants. It's not a man or a woman who has the gift of healing. It's a gift that God gives to that person. It's gifts of healing. And of course... The gift of miracles is also linked with it. Spiritual, spiritual gifts often overlap. The healing of the body was one thing, but this man had been born disabled. Fixing his body was one thing. That was amazing. The fact that his legs could now function and they were healed and strengthened that was great, but you also needed another gift, the gift that we might call a miracle. Because how did this guy know how to walk? If you've ever had a hip operation or you've had any other uh, problems with your legs, you know that there are times afterwards where you have to learn to walk. Some people go to physiotherapy, don't they, to learn to walk again. Even losing your big toe can be a huge problem, apparently. Uh, and you have to learn to walk again. This man had never walked. Never at all. And yet, as we know from the song that we teach our children, he was walking and leaping and praising God instantly. That was a miracle. So the healing and the miracle was all sort of mixed up in one, God does amazing things to people. And of course, there was the gift of helps too. Peter helped him up. So he just, you know, he didn't say, oh, get on with it and leave it to somebody else. He lifted the fella up. So, like most miracles, not all, especially if you check up in the Bible, you'll see that there are exceptions to this, but like most miracles it was instantaneous it was complete and it was long lasting you ever seen these people that tell you um, oh uh, oh yes I, I, my eyes have been healed I, 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 can, I can read now <laughs> and you think what <laughs> are you, who are you kidding and people that say that they've this that and the other has happened Praise God when he does bring a miracle into our lives. But you can't press button B and say to God, I want a miracle. It's God's sovereign will that controls the whole thing. Miracles, when you see them, are instantaneous. They are complete. And they're long-lasting for the most part. They don't... As some evangelists I can remember in the past put up big signs outside their tent, arthritis cases specially welcome. 
If you know anything about arthritis, you know it comes and goes. It depends on what... That's, that's just making money out of the gospel. That's a travesty of the true thing. A real miracle is something that God can do when he chooses sovereignly to do it. And the gift of healing as well is in his hands. This man may have been walking and leaping and praising God for a long time, but I expect he had to take a rest. And I'm sure he listened to Peter's sermon that we get for the rest of this chapter. It was the name of Jesus that made all the difference in his life. It healed his legs, and then I'm sure that this man was healed spiritually too. We don't read that he became a, a member of the church, but we can certainly feel that this guy must have been so thrilled with what had gone on and so impressed with Peter and John that he became part of that group of, as the next chapter we'll get to in Acts tells us, that 5,000 men, and the word is men, not the generic man that we sometimes use of human beings, 5,000 men trusted Christ after that sermon, plus the 3,000 that were converted on the day of Pentecost, and daily God was adding to the church those who were being saved. It's wonderful. This man who was barred from the temple, Leviticus 21, told him, you can't go in, mate, sorry. You've got to be physically healed. You've got to be perfect in your body before you can come in. The temple police would have kept him out. And yet he was able, after the healing, to enter the temple for the very first time. And when Peter saw what was going on, of course, he used his spiritual gift, the gift of evangelism, and started cracking on immediately. Repent and believe, repent and believe. And the great sermon followed the particular uh, events concerning the man. Look at these man, the man's eyes as he was going up into the temple. His eyes say it all. I can remember some young people over the years that have, have sung in Christian groups. And they were singing beautifully, but their eyes were not. There was no convincing truth coming out. They were singing beautifully, but their eyes were telling a different story. And you can tell that about Christians, can't you? you we used to play uh, uh, a game when we used to go up to Bloomsbury Church, Bloomsbury Central Baptist Church in London, and we'd, we'd, uh, we'd play Spot the Christian on, on the way, <laughs> uh, on the tube. And sometimes it was easy because they'd have a big Bible, <laughs> that was a big giveaway. Uh, uh, or the ladies in those days used to have a bun, now it's the men, isn't it? <laughs> and so it screws that up. But we used to try and pick out those who were believers. And you can tell from people's eyes whether they're with you or not, whether they love the Lord or not, it's there. And if there's no response, and sometimes they might be singing the words, but their hearts are miles away. This man, for the very first time, was able to go into the presence of God. Let's make sure that this week we are real Jesus followers. Not just people that say we're Christians, people that say, oh, I go to church. But real believers are Jesus followers. They follow Jesus step by step. We may not be walking and leaping and praising God, but we certainly can walk in his presence, pray without ceasing in that sense that Paul, Paul meant it, and serve the Lord during this coming week. There's a lovely song that we sometimes sing. It's in Christ alone. And we need to be reminded of that. That's what puts the light in your eyes. That's what puts the light in your heart, Christ, 
alone. Nobody else, only him. 